It's my pleasure to introduce Anish. He's a assistant professor at Columbia. And to me, his research really kind of embodies this interdisciplinary approach that fuels some of the greatest work in kind of the space that we're trying to cover. So more from the theoretical side, uh, that work focuses on causal machine learning, reinforcement learning, and high dimensional statistics. But that's brought together with uh, to kind of make foundations for data driven decision making and applications in engineering and social systems. So today he'll be discussing his work, Synthetic Combinations, a Causal Inference Framework for Combinatorial Interventions. And just to start us off, uh, I'll be today's discussant, which involves going through some of the papers that we've seen previously in this series to kind of set the stage and um, you know, make the connections that we're trying to make a little bit more clear. So we started off the talk series talking about identifiable representation learning. This is the very first talk saying what kind of setups in a very general sense where we have some latent variables and some observed variables that in this case are a deterministic fixing function of those variables um, will lead us to settings where we can actually identify either exactly this distribution of latent variables or identify it up to kind of some indeterminacy that's based on the types of tasks that we actually want to perform downstream of learning that representation. So we got into causal representation learning, talking about that latent representation being in the form of a causal graph, variables related by a causal graph, and trying to learn that representation from interventions. In Jachi's talk uh, in particular, uh, she talked a little bit about how learning that kind of representation allows you to extrapolate from things like single gene knockouts to double gene knockouts, or more generally, just single node interventions in the latent space to combinations of those interventions. We moved on a bit into causal abstraction. This took a bit of a different perspective, saying that we already know a kind of more fine grained causal model, and we're abstracting that into a coarse grain causal model that is kind of consistent with what we saw originally. And finally, today we're going to uh, be getting a little bit more directly into focusing on how these models we learned, how these kind of representations and core screenings allow us to extrapolate. So here I'm picturing some space of actions, some space of either context, or you might say individuals who you want to think about what each of those actions will do to each of those different individuals. And by giving some modeling assumptions on how those actions and the traits of those individuals come together will show that you can tell what actions do to individuals, even if you haven't seen that action on that individual before. So with that, I'll uh, let Anish get started. And as always, I guess most people already have their video on, but make the discussion more engaging by turning on your video and just ask clarifying questions um, during the talk and save kind of more open-ended questions for the end of the talk. Awesome, thanks for the very kind introduction, Chandler. Um, and so a lot of this work, some of this work was done with Chandler and, and Caroline and Dennis and Dave up there. So it's fun to be back talking about uh, how it's been extended. Um, let me see if I can... Perfect. Can you see my screen? Awesome. Yep. The 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 yeah. okay. So uh, hey everyone. So today I'll be talking about synthetic combinations, a causal inference framework for combinatorial interventions. This is a joint work with Abhinit, who is on Zoom, and Suhas. Uh, I'll point out that the majority of the work was really done by Abhinit. So if you have any tough questions, uh, send them send them his way, not me. Um, great. So, so what's the key framing question for this entire talk? Uh, so it's about, you know, when we think about causal inference, we always ask what will happen to Y if we do A, right? Y is the outcome and A is the action, as, as Chad very nicely put together. 
And but a lot of times, you know, in practice, I've seen this in, in many different situations where you're interested in this combinatorial counterfactual. So what will happen to Y if we take a combination of actions, right? And there's many different places that shows up. For example, recommended system. This is a uh, a common. This will be like the running example we use throughout the talk. So what will happen to users' engagement level if they recommended a new combination of movies? Right. That's what happens when you go to say Netflix's landing page. They don't just show you one movie. They show you a collection of things together. Right. Uh, similarly, like I say in gene uh, knockout experiments, you could have you know, what will happen to a patient's disease status if they be knocked down a combination of genes. That's always how you think about it in, in that setting. Or say in, in ML now, it's happening a lot. Uh, like what will happen to prediction performance if we select a different combination of features, right? There's all these different knobs you can tune about an ML model. Like if you ever played with Langchain, you know, 7,000 things you can tune. So how do you how do you think about these combinatorial things in a, in a unified way? Right, so you already need to understand is the effect that these combinations have and why. And so what's the common thread is that you want to learn the personalized outcomes under all combinations of actions. That's the goal we're going to be going after this in this talk. So what are the challenges? So in the experimental setting, it requires uh, a common total number of experiments to run. And I'll, and I'll quantify this in a second. Um, and the observational setting, you might just have insufficient data and um, unobserved confounding, which is, you know, you're, you're seeing the outcomes for a very specific set of combinations. And, and so there's missing of randomness and how does that, what challenges do that lead in terms of extrapolation to unseen, uh, you know, outcomes for unseen interventions and, and individuals and combinations. So let's just, let's just make this real. So let's just say um, I'm in the movie setting, right? And so I want to know what would happen to say Abhinith under this combination of movies, right? You could run an experiment, say, you could, you could force that uh, to show Abhinith that combination when he lands on Netflix and see what happens, right? Does he, how long does he stay on the platform? Uh, and that's, let's say there's many of us. So, you know, I'm here, Sohas is here. Right, so let's say there's end users to quantify it. Um, and let's say there's P movies, right? And so, and let's just say for the moment we can uh, we can show any combination of movies to the, on Netflix's homepage. So probably you can only show 10, but for the moment, let's say you can show any combination. Uh, and so the total number of combinations is two to the P, right? So the P movies is two to the P uh, possibilities. And so if I want to know what happens for every user under all two to the P combinations, you know, that's going to be infeasible. Right. Why? Because N is going to be very large. And then even if P is relatively large, it becomes pretty impossible because of the exponential dependence right, to, to the P. Right. So can we design a data efficient experiment to recover all these N times two to the P experiments? And when we get to the end of the talk, we'll come back to this question. Um, so now let's say we saw the observed engagement levels for uh, some engagement for, no, well, okay, sorry. One way of thinking about this problem is through a matrix, right? Uh, so here rows are, are the users, columns are different combinations of movies, and I observe them for some combinations. Of, I observe the engagement level for some uh, some subset of these uh, of, of movies and combinations. Now, if you just try to apply matrix completion to it as is and, and just hope for something good, it's going to end up terribly because for most combinations, you actually haven't seen any entries. Right. So most of your data. Is, so when you think about matrix completion. The underlying assumption is that for every row, there's a sufficient number of, of, of entries seen, and for every column, there's a sufficient number of entries seen. The problem here is that for most columns, you'll have seen no entries, and so matrix completion is not giving you any answer for those columns. Okay, so that's why if you just try to apply um, matrix completion as is, algorithmically, it's not going to work, and we'll show in theoretically even the sample complexity is going to be bad. Okay. So what's the causal framework for personalized combinatorial interventions? That's what this is going to be. Uh, the setup is that I'm going to think about each entry here as being a potential outcome. Okay. That's the way uh, I think about it. So n is for the nth user, and pi here is is the uh, the pi of combination because one of these two the things. And we're going to think of this as a uh, as noisy. This potential outcome is random, right? So it's like model based uncertainty because the assumption is, for example, uh, there's measurement error, or you know, I'm inherently a stochastic. Uh, being and so every time I go, I see a combination of movies. I might do something different, right? So what I'd like to know is an expectation every time I go onto say Netflix's platform. What is my average engagement level, right? So that's what the expectation here is, and that's what I really want to learn is the average engagement level for a combination of movies if I keep going on the website. And then this is the noise, right? And so this epsilon, uh, which is dependent on n and pi, that's my source of uncertainty in this model. 
Okay. So the question is, can we produce counterfactuals for every um, n and pi uh, for every n and all two to the p combinations? Right. So the n times two to the p outcomes I'd like to be able to estimate the expected potential outcome for. Okay. And also, please ask me any questions as we uh, as we go along. Uh, please don't wait till the end. Um, especially in Zoom, it makes it much more fun that way. Um, so. So now this will be the most mathematical part of the talk. The next, let's say, four or five slides. But I think that's really the the, the heart of this of this is of uh, this work is here. So um, so here's why I I hope you pay attention. After that, it'll be smooth sailing. Okay. So one way we we think about potential outcomes uh, in this world is through Boolean functions. So let me explain what that means. Okay. So let's say I give you a combination pi. So I want to know what would happen for this particular combination, Harry Potter and Transformers. And let's say this P movie. So in this world, there's only five movies. Okay. So one way to represent this combination all right, is through this Boolean. So, um, you know, in this set, the first two are in, right? So Harry Potter and Transformers are in, and then Hung Games, Breakpoint, and, and Drive to Survive are not, right? So, yeah. so one way of representing this is by a P dimensional vector where the first two entries are one and the next three entries are, are minus one, right? You can do it either through, I don't know why these balloons always come in my Zoom. <laughs> It happens a lot. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so we have this one, one, and then we have minus one, minus one, minus one. Right? Right? And you can see that every combination corresponds to a unique binary vector. Right? So any combina any subset of these key things will give you a particular binary vector. Right? There's a one-to-one -one mapping. Right? And now, actually, you can think of this, fun this, this expectation of yn, right? and then um, dot in the superscript, as being a function over binary vectors, right? It takes this binary vector of, of, of uh, you know, one minus one, one to the P and outputs a real number, which is the expected engagement level for that unit under that combination, right? And things that take in ve vectors of ones and minus ones and output a real number, those are called Boolean functions. Okay? And it's something that study, people study a lot in theoretical computer science and, and even more broadly speaking. Okay, so, so, you, so one way to think about it is you have this pi, Right, which is my combination, I convert it to a Boolean vector, right? And that's V pi. And then this expectation Y and dot is really a thing of it as a function which takes this V pi and outputs this real number, which is the expectation of Y and pi. So here's, here's one way of saying it is that for when you have common control interventions, you can think of the potential outcome function as something as a Boolean function. It takes in a, 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 um, a combination, converts it to a Boolean, and then outputs the real number associated with that Boolean. Okay. Now, what's interesting is you can even think of rankings in the same way. Okay, so rankings show up a lot. For example, in, uh, in like let's say you're at Google and you're uh, deciding which of the you know the five ads you need to serve, how do you rank them? Right, and you want to know what is the click-through rate for a particular ranking. Uh, it shows up a lot in say in matching markets. So if I'm let's say matching uh, doctors to residencies, you can think of that as a permutation of the doctors or a permutation of residencies. How do you look at it? The matching market can also be thought of as a as a um, as as a ranking problem, um, and so you can think of a ranking essentially as a permutation, right? So one, two, three, four, five. You now rank these five items. It's a permutation of these five items. Uh, so here's I want to call it permutation pi. What's nice is that permutation can also be represented as as binary vectors, right? Um, and here I won't get into it. It's in the paper, but you can really think of it as a as a boolean vector over p choose two. Right? So combinations over P things can be thought of as a Boolean vector over P things. A uh, ranking over P items can be represented as a Boolean vector over P choose two things. Right? And one way of thinking about it is that I have one, two, three, four, five. Uh, the entry, the I, J at the entry, so I comma J at the entry, this double index, represents whether I shows up before J in my ranking. Right? So if I is before J, and in answer to the permutation, I remains before J, then that particular entry is one. If now J appears before I, then it becomes minus one, right? So kind of, you can think of it as like a pairwise comparison, and then that's one way of encoding a ranking and a permutation, okay? But the number of the length of it is now longer. It's now P choose two versus P, okay? So what's nice is that all the work we're gonna do and show you for the, the world of combinations also extends to the world of permutations. So you can think of it as like, I will not produce kind of factual for different rankings. This is the same kind of framework we'll go through. Okay. Any questions so far? Um, 
this is maybe it's been a really long time since I've seen this, but but um, it it this is reminding me somewhat of combinatorial auctions as well. Is there a, is there a connection to that or or not? Yeah, so I think they use. Um... I mean, there's no no work of incentives and, and, and that kind of work here at all. Uh, but you can, I think this, the, that's a really interesting application of the stuff, especially if you, you know, there's a lot of work about le learning distributions in, in combinatorial in auctions and how do you do that efficiently. Mm -hmm. um, there, I think in general, you, you think about it as a single auction happening, right? And you're getting repeated mm -hmm. measurements from it. I think... Oh, I think we'll discuss it at the end, but I think it's an interesting thing to think about what we haven't, which is that think of it as N parallel combinatorial auctions that are happening. Can you learn yep. from across them in an interesting way? So I want to know what would have happened for auction five if I'd instead yep. done the type of pricing or something that happened in auction 10. That's a really interesting thing that I actually haven't thought about at all. So thanks for Yeah, that'd be, that'd be fine. It'd be a fun connection to probably get past some of the worst case results as well, potentially in, in, yeah. that, in that space. Mm -hmm. nice. another question just because you brought up permutations and i love permutations um so this mapping i assume is not surjective like over that whole space there will be some um plus or minus it's not a one-to-one -one mapping it's not a one-to-one yeah. -one mapping for the space in the space okay. of permutations which makes the 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 math a little bit uh, trickier, but okay, the algorithm remains the same, that. which is good. Yeah. yeah. So the algorithm kind of remains the same, but the math is trickier be exactly because of the fact that. Uh, uh, and because you're trying to, to avoid one. paying the price of how much you've blown up the space or something. Mm -hmm. There are more, uh, I believe, compact representations for permutations. And we'll talk about that in a second. So I'll, I'll make a comment about okay. that in a second. But you're right that things get a bit trickier exactly because it's not a one to one mapping between permutation and Boolean vectors. Got it. Uh, I have another question regarding the mm -hmm. per, uh, the permutations. Why don't we use uh, uh, to to make it one to one to one mapping? Why uh, don't we use groups uh, like uh, where the, each swap is a transposition and uh, each permutation is an element of the symmetry symmetry group on n elements? That sounds great. I mean, the permutations are very naturally represented as groups, but uh, I don't see. Um, Okay, maybe I'll come back to the question because we're going to use the this this Boolean function representation, uh, and we're going to translate that into an algorithm. So this idea of groups, I don't see how to convert that into uh, an algorithm, like a statistical algorithm. But if maybe we'll talk about that in a bit, and then if you have a, a, a suggestion, that'd be super helpful. Okay. So. Um, so, okay, so now how can we represent these Boolean functions that take in this Boolean vector and output a real number, right? So the, the, the naive thing you do is think of it as a one-hot representation, right? So it takes this function, uh, pi, and you just, you, you have a lookup table, which is two to the P, and you just have an indicator, right? So if I want to know what happens for uh, Y and pi, it's this, essentially is a sum over all possible values this function can take, and it's an indicator for the specific uh, pi that you care about, pi prime that you care about. Okay, so you're taking a sum over all combinations, uh, and you look at the outcome for combination pi prime. Okay, the problem with this is that you get no sparsity. So, for example, that in this particular setting, the only thing that matters in this combination is movie one. So, let's say all of my engagement is decided just by movie one. Okay, so if movie one was in the in my in my combination then something happens. If movie one is not in a combination, then something else happens. And then movies two to P have no effect on my engagement level. Okay, let's say I just care about Harry Potter, for example. Okay. Now, the problem is that if I, want, if I use this basis, or you try to represent my Y and pi, expectation Y and pi in this one hot encoding, then you still need all two to the P basis vectors to represent it. Okay, and that's not good. So is there a more compact representation that kind of, exploits the fact that maybe there's only the structure in which combinations matter and which don't. Okay. So the main thing we're using is that there's this notion of Fourier analysis of Boolean functions. I'm going to use that. I'll explain what that means. Right. So, so the Fourier characteristic is the following. So you have a Fourier characteristic. It's a function for every subset S of P. Okay. So there's two to the P of these things. And what it does is that if you input a function pi into XS, 
right? A Chi S, sorry. What it does is that it takes a product uh, of all the coordinates of S. So you take any Boolean vector. So let's say I have a Boolean vector of P. Now Chi S is going to be associated with a subset S. So you take that Boolean vector, you only look at the elements of this Boolean vector associated with the subset S, and then you take a product of those things. Okay, so let's do an example that will help. So let's say I have P movies, okay, and five movies, so one, two, three, four, five. And um, so let's say, what is the combination associated one, two, right? It'll be one, one, minus one, minus one, minus one, right? So I have P movies, I care about the combination one, two. I want to know what would happen under if I gave you combination one, two, I, read, I can write as one, one, minus one, minus one. Now let's say I want to care about the Fourier characteristic, Fourier characteristic for the combination one, two, and three. Okay, so what is the, for a character going to look like for chi s when you input in pi, right? It's going to be one, one minus one. Why? Because one is in this particular, for this particular uh, combination pi, uh, one is in there, two is in there, three is not in there. So you do one times one times minus one. Any questions about this? I'm just writing through an example of what a Fourier character is, and we'll talk about why these are important. So instead of trying to represent uh, so now I'm going to, these, what this Fourier character does in English again, is that it, it's, it's defined for a specific subset of P. For the particular subset of, of, of P, which is called an S, it looks at any combination, it looks at the Boolean vector of it, it, it subselects for the, the elements that are in this, in this group, S, the one, two, three here, and it multiplies them. So one, one, minus one, for example. Okay. Any questions? This is, this is the most mathematical slide, so. Okay, so the nice thing, the nice thing about using these Fourier characteristics to represent Boolean functions is that they actually form an orthonormal basis. So I look at any two characters, X, uh, chi S and chi S prime, that are any two subsets of P, uh, they only, they equal one if S equals to S prime, if not, there's zero, right? So they form this orthonormal basis of, uh, of, of the space of Boolean functions or Boolean vectors. Okay, that's really a key insight. Like that, not, not that we, we not that we found we're using. This is a key thing that people use about Boolean functions. Is that this particular basis is a really nice basis because it's an orthonormal basis. And as you will see, it actually a lot of this combinatorial structure you would want is really well compactly represented in this particular basis. Okay, so what I what I mean by basis is that if I take expectation y and pi, it can be written essentially as an inner product um, of of essentially the, let me write it here, of you look at every particular subset of S, right? So you look at all particular subsets of S and you can write it in this linear way, right? So the Fourier characteristics alpha N essentially are the Fourier coefficients that are associated with N. Because so YN, so remember YN is the function, the pi is the input, right? So expectation YN dot. So alpha N essentially are the coefficients associated with this function in this basis. Okay, and this basis essentially is a function of all of these different Fourier characters. So like chi one, chi one two, chi one one two three, chi two three, you can take the power set of all of these different Fourier characters and any function I care about, any function that takes from the Booleans to the real can be represented in, a, uh, in this basis. That is, it has a, any function can be written as a linear combination in this basis. Any questions? Okay, so just to repeat, we said we didn't like the one heart encoding. It didn't capture sparsity. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to use these Fourier characteristics. Turns out these Fourier characteristics form a basis over the over the over Boolean functions. So since they form a basis over the Boolean functions, what that means is that any Boolean function can be written as a linear combination of these Fourier characteristics. Okay, so it's just a basis in which you can represent this in this kind of function. And it turns out that it's a really good basis because uh, it leads to sparsity, right? That's how we think about bases for different kinds of functions. So for harmonics, we use uh, sinusoids, right? For smooth functions, we use polynomials. Turns out for Boolean functions, the Fourier characteristics, as they're called, is the right basis. Okay. Um, so what's the advantage of the... Yeah, please. Before we move on. Um, this is just in 
check my understanding basically before we um, go further. So my understanding is that so far to model these Boolean functions, we haven't made any assumptions that say that when you consider a combination of interventions, that they have some kind of additive structure where you're just going to sum up the effect of intervention one plus intervention two plus intervention three. We haven't made any such assumptions. Okay. No, we not. We haven't. But as we'll see in a second, is that um, that kind of assumption will imply that in this particular basis, this alpha n, which is the representation of this function, this basis is sparse, and it unifies any general. Okay, so I'll come to that in a second. But so far, we haven't. But it's coming in a second, and and it'll all be encoded through the sparsity of alpha n. And that's a good question. So, so to build up to the question that uh, uh, Daniel just asked, so we had this one hot representation that was the the trivial basis you could represent things. Then we had this Fourier representation, right? So in the trivial one, you just have a lookup table of two, all the two to the p things that this function could take, and you have an indicator function. And the other one is where you represent this basis, this Fourier basis, and you write it, it as a linear combination of these different basis functions. So let's return to the example where the only thing that matters is the first movie. Right? So in the one hot representation that requires all two to the p basis vectors to get anywhere. In the, the Fourier representation, you only need one particular Fourier character, which is the Fourier character associated with the first movie, so chi one. Okay, everything else you can set to be zero. Right? which is really nice. So you can see already with this very simple example where only one movie matters, it leads to the, the natural sparsity in this particular basis. Okay. So what kind of combination, so as we can see, what combinatorial structures naturally lead to sparsity? And then, yeah, this will get back to your question, right? So, so one example of sparsity, so one sparsity that people care about, for example, is if the engagement level only depends on say K movies. So let's say there's, you know, there's a hundred movies, right? But my, my engagement level only matters, let's say on fantasy movies. And let's say there's only 20, or let's say five fantasy movies in this massive set. Then in that setting, then the sparsity S of this, of this Fourier character is going to be two to the five, right? So rather than being two to the P, which is two to the hundred, it's going to be two to the five. And then the other one that, uh, so you're only taking the sum over the relevant movies. The other one, this, and this goes back to your point, Danya, is when you represent combinatorial functions as low degree polynomials. Let's say outcomes are only affected by pairwise interactions, then you'll have it as S is going to be, let's say, P squared. The example you gave where they only care about the additive, then this will scale as P, because you only need degree one polynomials to represent that kind of combinatorial structure. Right. So this is really the, the, the nice thing about this particular basis function is that you know, any kind of structure you would naturally want to put in this thing, and there are really two that come to mind. One is uh, K junta, which is basically there's a small subset that matter a lot and nothing else matters, and you allow for arbitrary dependence within the subset. Or everything matters, but they matter in a very like uh, simple way, like they add up, for example. That will be a low degree polynomial, and both of them lead to sparsity. And you don't have the nice thing you don't so, have to. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, the, the, the K sparsity example, that, 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 like which K it is can vary as a function of N, or is it always the same? Yes. K. No, it can vary across N. Okay. So, 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 so like, yeah. Just to check, I'm understanding this correctly. It's like every user has K has K movies they really would respond to, and everything else they don't really care about. Is that is that right? Yeah, correct. Those that K can vary across users, yes. uh, and then and they'll, and they'll be fine. But we'll see that to make even to make progress, we'll have to add some sort of structure that connects users. Right? So there's some there's 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 one algorithm that I'll provide which says our users are completely independent from each other. Like I cannot learn anything across users. And there's a certain algorithm yes. that will pop out and a certain sample complexity. If I, as I think is naturally true, is that there is structure across users, then we'll talk about how can you also Im impose that in this uh, algorithm in, a, in an elegant way. Yeah. And and I think of that as being like um, the set k is a function of some the rank structure or some, you know, some features of yeah. the, um, of exactly. the users themselves. So that's exactly what, that's exactly where we're going to go. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. So what are current approaches people use to assume sparsity is what they do is that they, for any particular individual, 
they will write out, you know, for any given combination, they will write out the Fourier characteristics. So they'll write, you know, they'll give you that basis. And then you run some sort of sparsely aware estimator. So for example, you run Lasso, right? So for example, I saw all the movies about Chandler, right? And let's say I saw out of the, you know, a thousand possible combinations, I saw his combinations under 25 of them. I can run Lasso bet between the engagement level, which is the Y, and the basis, which is my X, and then beta, essentially, the, the linear coefficients are the alpha n, right? And so you can run Lasso again. We assume it's sparse. We assume there's some structure in the way Chandler rates movies. Or you can do something like CART, which is, for example, more, uh, it's, it's fine-tuned for the CART, for the cage under setting. So Lasso only relies on the fact that it's sparse. CART is exploring the fact that it's a cage junta. So CART won't work, for example, when uh, you have a lower degree polynomial. So if it matters on, if, if you're, if you have simple additive structure, cart's not the right thing. Lasso will catch that. But if you have K Janta, then cart will work better than Lasso. Okay. And these are two papers that I think are really nice in the space. So Negaban and Shah, uh, and then Sirkanis and Sampatakis. Okay. So how would you do it? So we already I already talked about it. So you know, say for Sohas, those are the observed outcomes. And then I basically run lasso row wise, right? And I get the alpha hat n. And then, and then once I have the alpha hat n, then I can basically impute the outcomes for any given combination of movies for Sohas. Okay. So the problem is that we, if we exploit only sparsity, right? So remember, at the start, the number of total combinations or parameters we want to learn is n times two to the p. Now, if you have sparsity, right? So let's say the alpha n is of of is s sparse. The number of parameters drops from n times two to the p to n times s, right? which is great. But, and so let's say S is two to the K for K junta. The problem is that N times S can still be very, very large. Right. The question is, can we further improve upon this and make this say N plus S, right? So this, this multiplicative factor between N and S goes away. And that's, so the, the reason why it's not doing it is exactly the kind of question that um, Jason asked is that the sparsity is not exploiting any cross-sectional structure across units. It's, it's using a, it's doing a separate estimator for every unit, every row, and it's not, it's not using the fact that different rows might actually be quite similar to each other, right? And matrix completion, which is essentially is about low rank structure, is very good at thinking about how do you reduce the number of parameters in your system by sharing information across units, okay? So for those of you who don't know what matrix completion is, here's a one slide summary of 20 years of work. Uh, so you basically have this, this matrix of outcomes where you have rows and your columns, and what you say is that a few factors represent most of your data, right? So you say it's approximately equal to U V transpose, where U is, you know, basically you're saying there's an R dimensional latent factor that represents a U set, and there's an R dimensional latent factor that represents a combination of this setting, right? So then the total number of free parameters in your system then goes to, instead of being N times P, it's N plus P times R, where R is the rank of your matrix. And there's, you know, there's just a whole body of work uh, in, in this kind of world. I think fundamentally it comes out of three style of algorithms. You know, I've, I've played in this world for a long time. So one is nearest neighbor, which I think is beautiful. I think more people should be spending time thinking about nearest neighbor methods. And I think, I mean, nearest neighbor methods, as you can see, even in the world of deep learning and, and embeddings, it's, it's, it's a fundamental part of what's going on is, is nearest neighbors, right? Um, so then, then there's the, opti there's the uh, spectral filtering methods where you're kind of doing some sort of SVD of some sort or some take on SVD or optimization-based methods where you're doing, let's say, like nuclear norm minimization and, and those kinds of things. So the limitation of the lower rank matrix completion methods as we is that if you just have tried to apply that for the matrix that we had of n, you know, n two to the n, uh, with this n rows and two to the p columns, is that you have this exponential dependence on p, right? So even if you have, uh, you know, let's say 50, p is equal to 50, you know, you're kind of screwed, right? You're not gonna, the sample complexity blows up. Right. Um, and the second problem is that in our setting, actually, because you have this combinatorial number of, of columns, for most of the columns, you have no observations at all. That's going to be uh, killing you as well. Okay. So, so the question is can we somehow combine the strengths of both lasso or the sparsity um, that we have for combinations or the, you know, this Fourier way of thinking about combinatorial structure? and matrix completion, which thinks about structure across units. Okay, so we'll provide one natural model to think about it. I hope it leads to many, many more models that think about collaborative filtering and sharing across units and sharing across interventions. And in, in a way, this is just the first take at it. 
Right. So this is the model, right? This is the Fourier expansion of the expect of the expected potential outcome. So what is our modeling assumption? The first assumption is that this matrix is low rank. This matrix of rows being units and columns being combinations is low rank, um, which is that it's the R is a lot smaller than the minimum of n and two to the p. And there's sparsity that if you look at this matrix of uh, Fourier coefficients, right? So if I just take this alpha n, alpha one, alpha two, so on and so forth. This matrix is row-wise sparse. That means every row is sparse. Okay, so these are the two assumptions we make. The nice thing is actually that because um, this, if you look at this matrix, this matrix of outcomes, you can write it because you know because exactly of uh, of this of this part here, right? You can write this matrix of potential expected potential outcomes as a as a multiplication of two matrices, A, which is the matrix of Fourier coefficients. And this basis functions, the four characters. Okay, those give you the expected outcome. Because the matrix of four characteristics is um, is orthonormal, uh, the rank of the uh, outcome matrix is exactly equal to the rank of the four coefficients. Okay, what that means is that putting low rankness on the outcomes, the equivalent of putting the low rank condition on the four coefficients. So in the end, what are we really saying? We, the, the modeling assumptions are really all on this matrix of Fourier coefficients. What we're saying is that it's low rank, that means the structure across units, and it's row wise sparse. Okay. So we're making two assumptions. We're making more assumptions than, than the combinatorial structure world and the matrix completion world. And that's the only way to make progress, I think, in this world, but it's a natural thing to do. Right? So low rankness as a matrix and row wise sparsity. Any questions? This is kind of the end of the modeling part of it, the kind of the mathematical part of this talk. Okay. Yeah, please feel free to ask. I can also come back to it if, if needed. Okay, so this is the model of row-wise sparsity and matrix-wise low rankness. And that leads to a particular algorithm that we call synthetic combinations. Okay, so if you look at real-world data, this is kind of how it's going to look like. Right. You're going to have this matrix where most columns are have uh, missing data. And we'll go to an example after this from the movie lens world. Uh, and it looks exactly like this. So most columns, you have no data at all. Um, um, and then, right, so for those particular combinations, there's no data observed. And um, what we, and this is one thing you observe as well, which is that for some subset of people, they read a lot of things. And most people read a small number of things, right? There's this notion of like power users, right? There's some people like me who just, I've heard not, nothing better to do, so we binge Netflix all day. And so we have, I've seen lots of different kinds of movies, right? And so, um, so this is exactly what you see in data is that you have some people who are power users uh, for you have more entries and a lot of people you have very little entries, right? And so this is kind of an uh, assumption we'll make in the, in the system is that there's some set of users where you have lots of people, uh, some set of, of rows where you have lots of entries. We call, we call that our donor set, right? And the paper, we're going to provide a data-driven approach for this donor debt selection. I'll tell you why this donor set's important in a second. So what you do is that the first step is, this, so synthetic combinations is a two-step procedure. The first step is called horizontal regression, and the second step is called vertical regression. So what happens in horizontal regression? So just for the unit for the power users, we're going to basically run lasso. We're going to do that, that, that row-wise regression using lasso or cart or whatever it is, right? So... Exactly as you did, you did lasso to learn this, this uh, Fourier coefficients, alpha hat mu or u for this particular user. And then, then if you want to estimate the outcome for an unseen uh, combination for them, you simply apply alpha hat u to the Fourier coefficient associated with that combination. Right? So chi pi is the, is the uh, Fourier coefficient associated with the combination pi. You apply alpha hat u and that's essentially your estimate for the outcomes for that particular unit under that combination. Now you can do this for all of your donor units, right? And then you represent this for all of your donor units. And once you do that, you basically can, you have now, um, sorry, my headphones. Are... So once you do that, you then basically have, um, you've imputed the, the, all of the outcomes for my power users. Right, so I learned the lasso for a given row. I learned the alpha hat u, and I then imputed their outcome for every different combination using the Fourier characters. And I repeat this for every power user. Okay, and what is a power user? A power user is just someone who has has sufficiently number number of, of ratings or or observations under that 
combinations. Enough, you've seen them under a significant number of combinations. Okay. And now let's say I want to do it for the people who are non power users. What do I do? So um, I essentially look at the observed outcomes for these particular users. And I learn a method. So this look for those people familiar with synthetic controls, this looks kind of like synthetic controls, right? So you look at the observed outcomes for unit N and you run a regression between their outcomes and the observed and the imputed outcomes for the donor units, right? So let's say I observe some subset pi N for unit N and I want to know, so then what I do is I learn a, a, a mapping between that row pi N and the imputed outcomes for all the donor units associated with that subset. Okay. And the way we learn it is through PCR. Why PCR? Because PCR, what is PCR? So PCR is basically where you do PCA on my observed covariance to learn a low rank representation. And then you do um, uh, ordinary least squares after that. And that turns out to be the right thing to do here because we have assumed that my data is low rank. Right? So the lasso in some sense exploited the fact that row wise there's sparsity. And then the PCR is using the fact that matrix wise there's, there's low rank. Right? Because these are all high dimensional regressions, you have to regularize some way. And you should regularize based on what you believe is the right sparsity structure in the data. So it's either it's always going to be sparsity in the coefficients or sparsity in the matrix. If you have sparsity in the matrix, that's low rankness. If you have sparsity in the coefficients, that's lasso. Okay. Um, yeah. And then basically, once you have the learned that mapping that represents a user as some combination of my donor units, I take that, I then apply that to the uh, for the unseen combination pi for my user n. And then that's the algorithm, right? So this is a vertical regression. So uh, I learned, so in a horizontal regression, for my donor units, I learn a mapping, uh, I impute this way. So I, I, I impute it horizontally. And then for my, for my uh, non-donor units, I, I uh, impute vertically, okay? And that's essentially it. That's the entire algorithm. So it's two-step algorithm, two kinds of regressions that are happening. Any questions about, um, about this? I have a quick question, Anish. Um, in step one, what would happen, what would go wrong if instead of learning on just the power users, we learned on, I don't know, some more mediocre set of users who don't want, watch quite as much? Yeah, so I think the problem is that, uh, so there's a theoretical answer and there's an empirical answer. So the theoretical answer is that what you need is that the, um, the combinations for which you observe data for a particular user are rich enough so that you can efficiently extrapolate the combinations you haven't seen, right? <laughs> and so if I've only seen one combination, it's gonna be very, very, for a particular user, it's gonna be very, very hard to extrapolate to all the unseen combinations for them, right? So it really comes down to a question of extrapolation. Um, okay. and, yeah. Do you have any rules of thumb or um, maybe heuristics that are more theory backed, let's say for, Filtering the set of users and and getting these power users, in terms of yeah, so I mean, I, I'd say there's the there's the meat, meat and potatoes version of it, which is you just do cross validation, and that works really well in practice. You just run lasso for everyone, and then you see, and you hold have a holdout set, and you see which ones is it efficient, is it is it extrapolating well on, and then that's what we did. For as you'll see in the empirical setting. Uh, there's an experimental design setting that we say if you randomly sample some number of, you know, uh, so I'll get, when I get to the experimental design setting, I'll talk about the right way of doing it. Um, and then the theoretical part of it essentially is that if you look at the matrix of Fourier coefficients for the things you do see, what you need is that the, the Fourier coefficient for an unseen combination lies in its span. Right, so that's really what it comes down to. Yeah, yeah thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. So yeah, so it's this two-step algorithm, lasso or cart or whatever else, followed by PCR. And I'll just note that the technical challenge here is that um, this re essentially requires an error in variables analysis of the PCR because the, you know, the, the imputed values, right, are not equal to the true values. And so your covariates now are noisily observed, right? And, um, but the problem is that it's worst case error, it's not sub Gaussian error. And so you kind of need to redo a lot of the technical analysis for uh, PCR, but when your covariates are noisily measured in some way. So that's the technical challenge here that took some time. So uh, what are the empirics? 
So there was this uh, nice um, uh, benchmark by Sharma et al, where they listed the ratings of 800 users over 30,000 sets of movies. And a movie essentially had a, basically about a set, basically had about five movies in it. Okay. And so, and users rated about 45 sets on average. And, and in this particular, so this is the, this is the nice setting because it's like combinations. And so the, exactly their motivation was the fact that, you know, engagement is really associated with combinations of movies, not individual movies. And so they wanted to just kind of come up with a data set that, that represented that. And as you can imagine, most of the data was, was missing in this particular setting. So we can ask the question, is the low rankness and sparsity hold in this data set? Okay, so here's an empirical uh, study of it. So what we did is we looked at a subset of the matrix that was fully observed because they asked some users to rate a combination, some, some subset, combination of the movies. So they have a baseline for all the users. And uh, that was very, very low rank, right? So out of the 100 possible singular values, you know, most of the variance explained in the first three, right? So there's a lot of structure here. Yeah? And then there's also sparsity. So if you actually ran the lasso, the number of coefficients that were non-zero is about 8.7%. So there's a lot of sparsity. Right. So people rate different combinations in similar ways. Right. So the so this was nice uh, validation is that there was structure both across users and also across combinations. And that's really what we're exploiting. Okay. And then so how what we did is we compared with some baselines. So one is we did lasso row by row. So exactly kind of the anyway thing. That's we just do it to, you know in a in a naive way. I just do lasso for everyone. So that actually performed the worst. So that had an a error of 0 0.80. If you did uh, matrix completion methods like uh, SVD is like a, is a spectral filtering method or soft compute, which is a optimization method, then it did better. Uh, but if you do synthetic combinations, ways, which is where you do the row by the, the horizontal regression and the vertical regression, then it was significantly better than these other methods. So now when and why does this work? So in terms of the, the theoretical results, um, so that I think there are a few questions. So what conditions are necessary of the observation pattern for LASSO to work? Uh, what conditions are necessary of the observation pattern for PCR to work? What kind of confounding is allowed in observational data? Like in the movie lens thing that it was, uh, um, um, I believe is observational, but there's many, many settings in the world that are observational. So that's important to think about. And if I could design an experiment, uh, how would I design it so that the various conditions that I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about will hold with high probability? Okay. So what conditions, assumptions on LASSO and PCR? Uh, so for LASSO, I said, what you need is, we already talked about this, which is that the for the donor units, the four characteristics for um, the observations that do observe for them, the combination that do observe for them, uh, there's some sort of co coherence, incoherence condition that is the span of them needs to be sufficiently rich, right? So any other particular combination, the upper four character, um, characteristic lies in the span. And then for PCR, what you need is that subspace inclusion. That is the, if I want to impute for a particular non-donor non unit, a combination pi, uh, the, the expectation of, of, of that particular, that particular um, in expectation that, rating needs to be in the span of the ratings of the things you do observe for them, right? So it really comes down to these span inclusions. So what you need is like, in essence, um, what you need is that the, the observations you have for a particular donor unit are rich enough so you can extrapolate. And then for, for a non-donor unit, unit, they're also rich enough so you can extrapolate in some sort of way. And so these, these are kind of conditions formalizing that. <clears throat> Okay, cool. So what kind of confounding is allowed in observational data? So there's the classic selection observables, which is that you have these, you know, select, do you have this? So D here is the, is the intervention. So you can think of that, that decides what's missing and not missing. And then you have this, these observed covariates X, right? And selection observables means that conditional on X, the treatment and the, um, the outcome become independent. That's what selection observable says. That once I condition them, these things become independent. Um, right. So your y pi is independent of d given x. What here we is the selection unobserved Fourier coefficients, right? Which is saying that 
uh, conditional on these unobserved Fourier characteristics, my treatment and my assignment become independent. Right? So it's an analogous assumption, but now it's unobserved confounding because the Fourier characteristics, I'll remind you, are unobserved. So in summary, what are the assumptions? There's four assumptions. So there's a modeling assumption of uh, low rank plus sparsity. So row-wise, the four characteristics are sparse. The matrix of four characters uh, uh, are low rank. And then you have this uh, these two conditions that let you generalize for the donor units and the non-donor units. So four characteristic incoherence and subspace inclusion. And this fourth one is selection for a coefficient. So for these three, there's data-driven diagnostics that allow you to do it. And then, you know, this is to some extent unverifiable because um, with unobserved confounding, there's always something that's unverifiable. That's just the way it is, unfortunately. Um, so in terms of sample complexity, so with lasso, it exploits sparsity and not low rankness. And so the sample complexity scales as n times s square p. So the, the exponential dependence on p is gone, but you still have this multiplicative uh, relationship between n and uh, p. And then with matrix completion, you now have this additive structure between n and uh, S, and and p, but then they um, but there's an exponential dependence in p. And if you do synthetic combinations, you have best of both worlds, which is that you have uh, n plus s square p. Okay, and the natural compl nat sample complexity lower bound is going to be n plus s. Okay, now I'll just note that if you use if it's a k junta and you use cart then the sample complexity actually just becomes n plus s squared. So the dependence on p actually goes away, which is nice. Okay. So the nice thing is that if you assume a little bit more, then you can kind of close this gap by exploiting structure across both units and combinations. Okay. Any questions about this? Okay. And so now the last thing is like, how would I design an experiment if I could? So can I design an experiment that, that, that is, uh, in some sense, designed for this co synthetic combinations so that the, all the various assumptions of synthetic combinations hold? So, um, so, sorry. so here what I do is that the, how many donor units do I need? Uh, we need R donor units. So what is the experiment design? Experiment design is asking the question of what are the entries I should observe so that um, I can most sample in a most sample efficient way extrapolate everything else and my assumptions hold, right? So what this says is that the number of donor units need to sample is R, and for them I should randomly sample R square times S square times P combinations of movies, okay? And then for the remaining non-donor units, I need to rep I need to sample R to the four um, movies combinations of movies. Okay, so you basically have this L structure. I don't know why these buttons keep coming up. So I have this, this uh, uh, L structure, okay? And if you, so if you think about what matrix completion is saying, right, fundamentally, it came from double E. It's really a compressed sensing kind of problem. And it says that if you give me a matrix and you randomly sample entries from this matrix, so, you know, I, I give you all the double indexes of N and NP, and I randomly sample from there, that's a pretty good way of actually extrapolating to unseen things. So randomness is always a good thing, right? That's kind of like a big part of statistics is randomized. If you randomize, then you basically, with high probability, you're kind of seeing a lot of the space. In this world, rather than randomizing entry-wise, what you're randomizing is column-wise and row-wise. Okay, so you're randomly selecting R rows to be your donor units. And for them, you're randomly selecting this R squared times S squared times P columns to be seen. And for the non-donor units, you randomly sample R4 of these things. Okay. And that's all you need. And if you do that, then with high probability, all the various conditions we had for the subspace inclusion, the Fourier characteristic incoherence, they all hold. And with high probability, then you can actually recover all n times two to the p outcomes with n plus s square p parameters. Okay. So that, that's the way I, this L shape is the way I would set up an experiment if I could. Um, and with that, I'll end. Thank you.